I'm a fan of your both of yours since Breaking Upwards, which I saw at South by Southwest. And, um, so I'm really delighted to. Oh my God, that's amazing. Yep, Thank I, you. I've seen it lots of times too. So. Oh, I can't believe you saw it at South by Southwest I, 10 years ago. That's incredible. Oh, gee. Yep. Oh, gee. Wow. Yeah. So I'm going to let May um, get us started. Okay. Hi, I'll just give maybe the audience a bit of an overview of the collaborations, but. Um, one of your producers on Lola versus Michael London remarked that when people work with you, they're inside of your relationship. And watching your earlier collaborations, I witnessed characters that struggle with silence and being alone, wrangling with failure and self-doubt. They're comfortable both figuratively and literally sporting their undergarments for the world to see. <laughs> And characters are something of like leaking Brita filters for everything that bubbles to the surface. And you're both mining the intimate terrain of your partnership for your art. And in how it ends, the audience is now privy to Zoe's relationship with her younger tomboy version that's been outed by the Comet. So how did the pandemic influence the decision to collaborate on a narrative that excised a version of Daryl on screen? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let uh, Zoe take that one. <laughs> take it away, Zoe. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, I think that the pandemic um, forced us both individually to be sort of facing our most vulnerable selves. Um, and uh, oh, I'm gonna Daryl, take the Daryl. dog <laughs> into the frame because she's running around chewing things. Um, this is Lula. Yeah. Uh, and I think, um, so I think like it did, even though we were trapped in the house together, um, I think the work that we were doing wasn't really necessarily, um, I think the thing that we were trying to process was more uh, an individual journey um, and that sort of inner child work. And, um, and so I think, yeah, if the question is why Daryl was excluded from this on screen, well, I think that Daryl doesn't. I'm uh, happy to be. He behind, doesn't want to act behind the camera. Um, but I think that it was, yeah, like that. Kaylee, um, who plays my younger self in the film, and I had just collaborated on um, the Craft Legacy. She was the star of it, and so um, we had both an intimate working relationship and had become close friends. And she had become close with Daryl through that as well. And so I think um, it was exciting for us to collaborate again on screen, Kaylee and I, since we had never um, acted together. I'd only directed her, um, and that we were the three of us sort of um, dealing with very similar um, quandaries around how to speak to our inner children at this really singular moment in all of our lives where, um, yeah, the circumstances were just so sort of harrowing. Um, and how could we do that with a certain amount of levity while not denying um, sort of the impact of where we were at in the world? So does that mean that the writing of the film happened during the pandemic as well as, as the shooting? Yes, <laughs> we, we conceived of the film a few months after pandemic started. You know, the first couple months were spent feeling super depressed and worried and confused about what the state of the world was looking like and where it was headed. and. You know, we started to just have lots of conversations about ourselves and we were doing a lot of therapy to try and work through it and so much introspection and forced, you know, to look inward and be inside literally and figuratively. So uh, we, you know, got to a point where we just thought it would be cathartic and we were itching to um, get back to doing something creatively and it decided to embark on this on this journey uh which was really nice to have as something to do during pandemic in addition to all of the other work yeah um yeah okay may go ahead how it ends feels like an astral projection or something like an out-of-body experience of zoe's gaze 
She's kind of impossibly crisscrossing Los Angeles County in socks and heeled <laughs> sandals and her <laughs> final 24 hours feel surrealistically expansive. And I found myself wondering if Mandy had slipped her some ketamine or if she had smoked <laughs> Nick Kroll's character's DMT at the beginning of the film, which by the way, also um, speaking to that, you don't shy away from giving recreational drugs cameo roles in the narratives. <laughs> We're big fans. We're big fans. <laughs> um, we like to shout out recreational <laughs> drugs as often as we can. Um, but um, the ending of the film it's almost as if it's represent, uh, represented by a punctuation mark, like the period, a bold period. And she's at peace with herself. She's laid her doubts to rest. She's ostensibly sober. She's comfortable being in the silence of the now and at one with the unknown hurtling towards her. And I wonder if this symbolizes a permanent breakup with some of the reoccurring narrative themes um, in your film collaborations. What are we to make of this, this ending? These are deep questions, May. Um, <laughs> and we honestly, we've done we've done some interviews and we're like, we've got them down. And these ones, you're throwing us some real like right hooks. Um, and, good. and I applaud you. Um, Daryl, what do you think? I'll let you start. <laughs> um, uh, well, is my hair weird? Um, well, oh my uh, I, I guess like, hmm, wait, well, will you reframe the, the, the question at the end of like the beautiful dissertation that you gave? <laughs> yeah, for at least for the punctuation mark of, of my perception of the ending being a period, what are we to make of this particular ending, the message in relation to what might be your next creative incarnation? Ah, uh, aha, uh -huh, I see. Um, you know, I don't know. I think that when we, this- It's movie, definitely not the end. <laughs> this, <laughs> this film is like, um, I think for both of us, this film was really about like the process more than the product. Um, and I think we can both be very product oriented, um, especially at a certain stage in, in both of our filmmaking careers together and individually. Um, it's hard not to let that creep in, um, in the creative process. And I think what was really freeing about this was that we weren't thinking about um, like, what it meant <laughs> um, for our careers or what it, what it was saying or what, um, I mean, yeah, or, or how it would even be perceived, I think it was really just like, there was a sort of purity in the catharsis of it. Um, and that, that it was sort of experimental um, in nature, and we really didn't know what it was going to become. Um, it just sort of felt necessary um, to us as artists to do. Um, I don't know, do you want to add something? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, I mean, I, it was, it, it was, a milestone because it's the first time that Daryl and I directed together. Um, we had written together and produced together and acted together. Um, but, but this was the first time we had done that. So that was, um, a cool, a new step. Um, I wanted to ask you about your decision to have everyone face the end of the world with such calm. <laughs> Everybody was so chill about it. And, um, I thought that was such an an unexpected response when you know the people could just walk down the street and just so casually discuss you know what they were <laughs> about to face. What was going on with that? We've I think seen so many films that are like such like you know apocalyptic doom and gloom you know and like chaotic frenzied like mayhem. So that's not our style. Um, and I think like it was the film in many ways was kind of mirroring the emotional state and like wavelength that we were on at that particular moment, which was just like a lot of days of tedium and sitting inside. It was early in the pandemic when we conceived of it. So, um, I mean, there was, there was a lot of chaos <laughs> internally as well. And, and also externally as, uh, as continued throughout the pandemic. But I guess in some ways, like we were all forced this year to really 
like have to sit still and look at our problems, you know, societally, systemically, internally, personally, sociopolitically, in so many ways. And so, you know, this being the last day on earth, we thought it would be kind of fun if it was just a little bit of a quieter, more introspective look at how people come to the end and, and have to kind of resign themselves to their circumstances. So I guess that's kind of where the Zen like uh, quality <laughs> came from. Yeah. Had a beautiful effect. For sure. Thanks. Thank you. I lived in LA for about a decade and I was so shocked to see, um, you know, not only your filming locations, but the fact of course that they were empty due to the pandemic. And I, know that you began your working relationship in New York and I wondered if you felt like you might have been able to make this film in New York during the pandemic or if LA had to be the spot for this. I think it would have been yeah. it would have been harder for it to feel fully empty in New York and maybe not as original also just because like that movie I Am Legend and there's probably been others that are like bare apocalyptic feeling New York's, but I think there's something about walking through the streets of LA, which are usually filled with cars that definitely has a more surreal and eerie effect. So I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, New York, like even in the pandemic is still a bustling cityscape. Yeah. Um, and I think what was like for both of us um, when we did go out in our cars in LA in quarantine, it was um, so surreal to see so few cars out on the street. Um, and I think we wanted this to serve as a sort of time capsule of this moment that had never existed before and who you know hopefully won't exist again um where where there's this sort of desolate quality to to los angeles is that all contained in one area one neighborhood it seemed like it was no it no it was not um it was it was quite sprawling actually um because you know we we shot down in malibu on the beach and then we were kind of in the hollywood hills and a bit in the valley and then in Silver Lake, this it's not a it's not a real walkable. <laughs> you traced the real route, you wouldn't walk. There's it. definitely some <laughs> creative <laughs> liberties <laughs> we took there. Um, but you could you could make the argument that they might have taken a they might have hitched on the back of a truck here yeah. or there, mm -hmm. perhaps, or a bicycle. Or the younger self can fly. We just that's, you don't see that's it. That's true. Yeah. No rules. There no might rules. be teleport teleportation <laughs> qualities. Eat of ketamine. <laughs> On ketamine, anything is possible, as Whitney Cummings, you know, made clear. So, right. how did you um, choose the cast? Who? How did they participate in this film? Um, we are just very lucky to be friends with super talented people and to have worked with a lot of um, these people before. Um, and so, yeah, we just called um, them. <laughs> and, uh, and, and because it was fairly early in quarantine, um, for many of them, this was their first time on camera. And they um, each got paid $1 million. So that helps. Right. The rate was big. Um, but yeah, I think um, because it was so many of their first time on camera, like um, they were really interesting conversations to have because it's already like a conversation to call a friend and be like, do you want to do a movie? <laughs> you know, like, there's a lot of questions that have to be asked, but there, there were so many more questions that had to be asked in this circumstance. Um, and there was like a lot of trepidation from many of them about not even like the safety of it, um, but more about whether or not they'd be able to show up as performers from the emotional places that they were in. And especially in a comedy, you know, like, can we be funny right now? And can, can we um, access that part of ourselves? And I think for Daryl and I, we, we were really clear. We were like, yes, you can <laughs> meet us at 9 a.m. Um, tomorrow. <laughs> no, no, but we were no. clear that like they could show up for, in whatever emotional state they were in. And that was the beauty of this project sort of paralleling um, the the quarantine and the pandemic was that um, 
that we could just be free to kind of be wherever we were. Yeah, because the script was half written out fully, like Zoe's scenes with Kaylee were all fully written and scenes like with Helen, like the scene with Helen Hunt and Bradley Whitford were also written. But uh, a lot of other scenes were based off of like a structured outline with specific story and character beats that we wanted them to hit. And so they were able to play within this framework that Zoe and I created. And that was really liberating for, I think, a lot of the actors to be able to bring like what Zoe's talking about, you know, themselves in whatever place that they were meeting us at you know, into their characters and into the scenes, um, which made it feel loose and fluid, which was kind of the experience that we were trying to create so that it felt really intimate and, and authentic at the same time. So the Olivia Wilde scene, I, I have to know how that went down. <laughs> how fun, I mean, how it was, was that one of those that you're speaking of? Yeah, yeah that, that was, um, a pretty structured outline uh, of that scene. And there was even like, um, you know, some dialogue written that we wanted to hit, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was improvised and, um, and it was the most fun thing ever. <laughs> it was the first time that Olivia had stepped foot outside her house, she had said, and like first time she was doing something. And so it was like very surreal seeing her and for her to like come to the location and, and then like her and Zoe are just pure magic. I was like, Aww. can we just make another movie just starring you two? Because they're just so incredible together and their chemistry is unbelievable. And we had like 20 minute takes with them where I just like kept the camera rolling because it was just too funny to not let them just riff with each other. And the stuff they were coming up with was just priceless. Like there's so many like amazing moments actually on the cutting room floor that we couldn't even put in. But it was, yeah. no, I mean, because we hadn't, like, it was Olivia's first time leaving her house and, um, and it was sort of my first time hanging with a friend, um, in that way, like that I hadn't seen in a while. And so like, there was also that sort of excitement, charge. To, yeah, the charge of like, oh my God, we get to talk to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I watched that scene. I just had to go and watch it three times and I screamed <laughs> and I, and I have to also say that I have not, I live alone. So I have not been laughing but like for a year, you know, almost a year. I just, because when you're alone, you just don't laugh out loud. Even when you watch something funny, it's not the same, you know, when you're with other people, yeah. you know, laughter is just kind of con contagious or, you know, maybe perform it for other people, but you kind of do. Yeah. It makes more sense to share a laugh, but um, I laughed out loud so many times in this movie and that just doesn't happen often. So I, I thank you for that. <laughs> thank you so thank you. much. And also I have to say that Zoe, I think you are so brilliant at um, at drama and comedy together on a dime, you know, and, and back and forth. And I just, re I've always related to that so much when, when I first saw you in Breaking Upwards, I think. I just, I love how you do that. It's so um, poignant and, and powerful, so. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I, I feel like I'm watching a real person, um, like a really funny person who feels things deeply. So. Yeah. <laughs> I can attest that is true in real life as well. She is very funny and she feels a lot of things. Very deeply. <laughs> I, and I do want to also um, reiterate that it was so meaningful to have a film um, in Sundance that it has levity um, because I think so many people really need that right now. There are a lot of important stories to tell in the world, but um, you told this um, with some healing vibes that I appreciate it. So thank you again. Thank you so thank much. You. Everyone needs a little TLC, you know, right now. <laughs> I, we're living in like, yeah, such a crazy time still and so much PTSD from the last four years and in general, just with everything this year, it's been intense. So we, we I think really wanted to laugh as well as cry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's important to, try and find the light in the dark. 
Yeah, you made it. You made a great film for this moment. So mm -hmm. thank you for sharing it with us, and thanks of for talking course. with us. Thank yeah, so absolutely. Much. Thank have you a great so much. Festival. Sure, and I hope I hope to see you again. Come through Nashville sometime with with your next film. Hopefully, oh, we would love to. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah. We'd love to. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye, y'all. Thank you so bye. much. Bye. Thank you so much. <laughs>